Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I'm Bob Allison. I chair the Rev 250 Advisory Group. I also teach history at Suffolk University. And our guest is Kirby Martin. Welcome, uh, Jim. Welcome back. And Thank Professor you. Martin is the U. Roy and Lily Kranz Cullen University Professor of History at the University of Houston Emeritus. He's also taught at Rutgers and at the United States Military Academy at West Point as an advisor to Fort Ticonderoga and Fort Plain, has written more than a dozen books, mainly on the American Revolution, Social History of America. One of his first books was about drinking in America. And he is, for our purposes, in a historian and consultant to the Oneida Nation, the Native people who are were really an important part of the story. And you and Joseph Glatar wrote a book, Forgotten Allies, the United Indians and the American Revolution. So thank you for joining us. Thank you. In turn, it's very much my pleasure to be with you again and to talk a little bit more about yes. this very important story about the United Indians and Indians more generally, uh, at least in the northern phase of the Revolutionary War. Yes. It is really an extraordinary, extraordinary story. And the general impression we as historians have is that most native people sided with the British. Now, is that true or is that an exaggeration? Well, it, it probably is true when we use the word most, but I think a little bit better word, at least, at least at the outset of the war, would be neutrality. Initially, let's be careful about what we do. Uh, and there are lots of different reasons for that. One of which is uh, if we get too involved on one side too soon and that side loses, we lose. So it, it's kind of like basic diplomacy or basic survival or whatever you term you would prefer or concept you would prefer to use. And in the end, I would say most did in some way move from a state of neutrality to passive acceptance of the British side or even active acceptance of the British side, which for instance was very true in the Six Nation of Indians in New York, the Iroquois speaking Indians, the Haudenosaunee people. Uh, the, the, point, the point about that is most of them joined the British side and the Mohawks and the Senecas were especially active. Whereas the Oneidas were committed to neutrality. In fact, mm -hmm. that is the big issue that is going on in 1775 and 1776. And I could give you this, this uh, story, I think, as an example. Uh, and that is that uh, as the war breaks out after Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, one of the powerful British leaders who has replaced Sir William Johnson, he's a nephew of Sir William Johnson, who had been the key Indian agent uh, and influencer in the area with the Mohawks. He will, uh, this man's name is Guy Johnson. And as a nephew, He's sort of taken over part of the role of the important Johnson family in maintaining these relations. He will lead a group of Indians, Mohawks, into Canada, and he will get them to agree to join in attacking the Americans. That's what, that's what it's all about. That's mm -hmm. right. We're going to go back into the valley, and we're going to show them a thing or two to wipe out all of this revolutionary activity. Mm -hmm. Well, they even get a war belt, all right? Mm -hmm. That is a uh, wampum. And we're going to get the Bostonians, lay Boston A, or however you want me to mm -hmm. say that. Anyway, this, this then leads to a conference with Philip Schuyler, who is the leader in the New York area, the Mohawk Valley area. He's a, he's a wealthy, mm -hmm. wealthy individual. And he is both now a major general in the Continental Army. He will become that in June of 75. And he's going to be the chief Indian negotiator. And his job is to keep the Indians neutral. Right. Stay out of this. This is the family quarrel. Stay out of our quarrel. 
because they know if all the Indians turn against the Americans, that'll be a devastating blow to the cause. Mm -hmm. That is the Patriot cause. Well, so there's a meeting, in a, a, a grand meeting in August. It's going to continue into September at another mm -hmm. location. Uh, and it's in the German Flats area. And Schuyler raises so much hackles. And by the way, the Mohawks largely did not attend because they're on the side. Let's get into this and let's get mm -hmm. rid of these uh, Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the white settlers. And the bottom line is because of Schuyler's influence, there'll be a meeting of the Grand Council. That's the, the, the Sachems, the 49 chief Sachems peace chiefs, if you want to use that term, who will be meeting Grand Council in the Syracuse area in the Onondaga country. Mm -hmm. And they, in turn, vote all but unanimously to take those war bills and to give them to Schuyler and go back to neutrality. Mm -hmm. So they call out, the Indians do, of the Six Nations, they call out the Mohawks and say, let's stay out of this thing, neutrality, neutrality, neutrality. Mm -hmm is the message that they are pitching. That's the best way for us not to suffer, to suffer some form of devastating loss or losses if we get engaged uh, in this particular military context, uh, contest that is now taking place. So that's, that's what's going on. Neutrality is the word of the day. But everybody has to decide. Just because you got neutrality doesn't mean individuals can't decide whether they want to remain loyal or whether mm -hmm. they want to join the uh, rebel side of the contest that is going on. Interesting. So on the one hand, we have the 49 Sachem saying neutrality, but then individuals can decide if they want to. That's join correct. Them. They can, but they're on their own. That's one of the interesting things about uh, the very, very, as I've said on more than one occasion, sophisticated uh, political structure mm -hmm. that consensus rules but if you don't like the consensus, whatever it is, you got wow. two choices, shut up or move. <laughs> That's wow. basically what it boils down to. And you will find some Indians over the years who don't agree with whatever the dominant policy is coming out of the all of the uh, villages up to the Grand Council level. Mm -hmm. They will say, oh, maybe I better move westward and uh, become a, a, become another or join another group or that sort of thing. So there's a certain degree of mobility among the native folks. Yes, there is. There is. It isn't, it is not, mm -hmm. it is anything but a dictatorship. Mm -hmm. Where let's say you have the, the high, 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 high chief. The yeah. high, high chief in the Oneida world is called the Otachede, if I even come close to saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. The Indian at that time who had that role, his name is Grasshopper, that's what we know him as, mm -hmm. and he basically has to listen to the people. Mm -hmm. it's re it really is kind of a very democratic kind of uh, system they have. But mm -hmm. if you as an individual disagree, well, you got the two fundamental choices. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it's uh, very, very interesting for, as we've talked about before, these people are not savage when it comes to the way they organize themselves politically right. in lots of other ways. Right. So, but then the Mohawk scene is so, so the Mohawk then are making a choice about where they stand. Uh, some of them are with Guy Johnson and what, uh, uh, let's. That's true. Yeah. That's true. I mean, the Mohawks, generally speaking, uh, and by the way, great numbers of Mohawks have already moved to Canada anyway mm -hmm. during the 18th century because they really are being the eastern door of the uh, Six Nations representing the eastern side, they have had the most disruption mm -hmm. of white settlers moving into their territory. And one of the solutions is we'll migrate elsewhere. And so right. there's a lot of migration into Canada. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's they have they have two principal uh, castles, as they would call them. We call them villages. Uh, but mostly the Mohawks you can think of as pro-British. Okay. And Canada is really a focal point for both sides. The Americans have an invasion in 75, 76, and then in 76, in 77, Burgoyne has a plan to come down yes. the Hudson, and also another 
part of it. Now, what's the impact of Burgoyne's campaign then on the neutrality of the Iroquois? Uh, from my point of view, it, it is a major, major impact. And let me just offer up here a little bit. Uh, the Oneidas especially, uh, with the exception of the Mohawks and maybe some of the Senecas out west, um, they are pushing and they are winning on the issue of neutrality in 1776. There is this whole invasion of Canada on the part of the rebel cause, 75, as you know, one of my uh, subjects, Benedict Arnold's heavily involved in that. Yes. And then there's a big retreat in 1776 uh, Arnold fighting at Falcor Island in October will help delay the British coming out of Canada with a major force in 1776. And that sets up the stage for General John Burgoyne to lead another major force out of Canada uh, in the late spring, June of 1777. Mm -hmm. And just very quickly, we need to review the plan, that is the operational plan that Burgoyne had for his force. The main force is going to drop south uh, out of moving south out of Montreal uh, and we'll go up Lake Champlain. The water does flow north, so we've got to go up Lake Champlain against the current. Uh, we're going to uh, use Lake George and other routes, and the goal is to get that army to Albany, where another force, British force, is going to come out of New York uh, City, and we're going to cut then uh, the New England colonies from the others, and sort of what they're thinking is we're going to cut off the head of the rebellion because the rebellion actually began. The shooting war began in the New England area, as we all know, at Lexington and Concord. Well, anyway, the, 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 the point is that's part of the plan, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. It's going to be a force of 8,000. Mm -hmm. The second part of the plan is to send a diversionary force under a British colonel who is breveted briefly as a uh, uh, general uh, and uh, is a brigadier. And he's going to lead a smaller force, assemble it on Lake Ontario at Fort Oswego. Very important. Mm -hmm. So he's going to go up uh, the St. Lawrence River on, onto the lake, Ontario, located at Oswego. And there he's going to gather his whole force. And who's going to gather with him? primarily uh, Mohawks, and one of their leaders is this person we've talked about, Joseph Brandt, and Angia, or however you say it, very famous uh, Indian leader, and also coming over all the way across the lake uh, from the western end from Fort, uh, uh, I forgot my fort, but anyway, the, the point is that uh, the this force will may be made up largely of Senecas with a few Cayugas and mm -hmm. no Oneidas. All right. Okay. Now that that is the, that is the uh, that is the understanding the key here. All right. So this force is going to then it's it's a diversionary force. Mm -hmm. We're going to drop south, and you drop south right into what Oneida territory. Right. Okay. You drop. You're going to drop south on the Oswego River cross over Oneida Lake, Wood Creek, and their target initially is what is called Fort Schuyler. Actually, most of the time we know it as um, uh, Fort Stanwix. Right. But in the war, they call it Fort Schuyler out of honoring Generals uh, Phillips. Yeah, the, the, the Americans call it Fort Schuyler. The British call it Fort Stanwix. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. So this is, a, you've got to knock that fort out, and there is a Continental Regiment there of about 750 soldiers. Mm -hmm. Uh, the third New York, and uh, we got to take them out because we can't have a major continental force in our back while we're mm -hmm. sweeping eastward right. down the Mohawk River to Albany, where you're going to link up, uh, hopefully, uh, with Burgoyne. Well, mm -hmm. we all know that Burgoyne never got there because he was stopped in the Saratoga battles in October, mm -hmm. um, September and October right. of 1777. But anyway, let's trace now. Now you have a force. John Butler is one of the leaders, is an associate of the Johnsons. Mm -hmm. And you have all these Indians gathering. This force gets up to about a size of 1,800 to 2,000. And 
Remember, it's got to drop through our Oneida territory mm -hmm. because Fort Stanwix is actually in Oneida territory. And then we're going to sweep east. So mm -hmm. let's go back to the League of Peace and Power. Right. Or the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. There are certain rules of the Confederacy. Rule number one, we don't kill each other or fight and kill each other. The second rule that's going to be so important here is we don't invade the territory of one of the nations without their permission. That's a matter of respect, mm -hmm. political respect. The Oneidas, knowing that this column is forming up uh, on Lake Ontario, will send a small delegation, Grasshopper, this uh, uh, great chief, uh, the Adedeshe, uh, is involved in this and says, you don't have our permission to march your force through our territory. Well, what's the British response? Go squat. Yeah, we yeah. don't need your permission. We're larger. We're more powerful. Mm -hmm. Get out of the way. Mm -hmm. Well, this sets up an obvious conflict. And this then becomes a critical difference for the United is moving from a position of neutrality to working with and fighting alongside the Americans mm -hmm. uh, and those, uh, in this particular story, those uh, Continentals gathered at Fort Stanwyck. So the Oneidas know they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so they will have to decide what are they going to do? Stand aside and ignore, or will we join the American forces? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, in the end, as you sweep through this story, uh, many of the Oneidas will go and gather in and around the fort, uh, uh, the Sky, Fort Schuyler for protection, but some of the warriors will join with 60 to 100 Oneida warriors uh, and uh, some Tuscarora warriors thrown in will join with the Americans to try to ward off this British column that is coming. Mm -hmm. Now, among those individuals are Skenandoa, mm -hmm. all right, and also uh, Han Yeri Dockstader. And his wife, uh, Doc Stater's wife, that we've called Tyone or Two Kettles. She's also involved. In fact, she'll go on a ride warning settlers uh, farther, that is, down the Mohawk Valley, that the British are coming. Wow. Right? That's an amazing story. It wasn't just yeah. Paul Revere and some others. But mm -hmm. actually, she does some of that, too. Right. But it's in 1777. It doesn't get quite as much attention. That's so that's where we're at. Okay. We're a stalemate. What's going to happen? Yes. And uh, uh, but so she, she, and Oneida is going to warn the English Dutch settlers along the Mohawk. Yes. The British forces coming. That's after. that's right. And she will also make contact then in that warning process uh, with uh, Nicholas Herkimer. Mm -hmm. You can visit the Herkimer Harm today. I'd recommend it. It's a New York State site that overlooks the uh, Mohawk River on, on from the southern side. And he is the militia general in that area. It's called Tryon County. All right. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's he now knows he has to organize the militia and he has to go up the Mohawk, mm -hmm. or march along the Mohawk and try to relieve what is happening now because the, the British force, Indian force coming down has now put by August 3rd and 4th, Fort a Schuyler under siege. Hmm. So they need to relieve mm -hmm. that. Now he has with him seven to 800 militia. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the story, by the way, is played out in that, not one of my favorite movies, Trump's Along the Mohawk. Uh, Gil Martin is part of this story and so on and okay, so forth. Yeah. The movie goes. Anyway, so he's got to get up there. And it's a forced march. And by the evening of August 5th, they have arrived and they're next to a small Oneida village called Ariska. Mm -hmm. And running close to there is the Ariskany Creek, which will dump its waters uh, into the Mohawk River. All right. Mm -hmm. So that evening, what is going to happen is that those 60, we don't know exactly, to 100 warriors will join Herkimer's column, mm -hmm. all right? And somehow 
Tyona's going to get back involved in this too. Wow. She comes back from her ride. Wow. Now this argument breaks out in the American force, it goes back to the tension, the relations, because there have been some bad incidents before this uh, where there's been some killing on the part of various uh, Indian groups under Joseph Brandt. Mm -hmm. and, and some other killing in the area, in the valley. And the subordinates of Herkimer say, we don't know, we can't trust these Indians. They're saying, well, we'll go out and scout. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll form, you know, uh, pickets. We'll, we will go beside the column and we'll sort of tramp through the woods and make sure the enemy isn't there going to gang up on you. Mm -hmm. And the subordinates say, you can't trust any Indians. You can't, the Indians are all the same. You know, they're, they, it goes back to that stereotype. Yeah. And Herkimer is saying, wait a minute, I know these people, I trust these people. So what happens? Herkimer, to quiet down those subalterns, his lieutenants and so on and so forth, captains, uh, he says, okay, we're not going to send the Oneidas out in a scout. Mm -hmm. We're not going to use them as pickets. We're just going to march forward not being aware of what's going on on our flanks. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, because this is developing, Joseph Brandt, working with uh, John Butler, working with various Indian groups, especially Mohawks and Senecas, say this is the opportunity to set a trap. Now, they don't know there aren't going to be scouts out there. Right. But they go ahead and send forces down, including, by the way, we haven't mentioned John Johnson, Sir William's son, known as Sir John Johnson, he has formed a loyalist regiment called the Royal Greens, and they'll eventually get in what now I'm setting up is what we call the Battle of Oriskany, one of the most important un today unknown battles of the whole Revolutionary War. Herkimer goes forward on uh, October 6th, and uh, anyway, I'm sorry, I said October 6th. Why am I in October? I'm sorry. It's it's August. August. August 6th. Somehow I, I jumped back to Ticonderoga. Right, yeah. Back to August 6th. And I met August 5th before. And he'll move forward and he walks right into this trap. Just think of an upside down U. And you're marching your force right into the upside down U. Wow. And that's yeah. exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. And then once they get enough of that uh, force at this Oriskany battlefield, and the, the territory goes down. Uh, mm -hmm. through a swamp area and then back up on what is a military road leading uh, up six miles away to Fort uh, Schuyler. Once they, uh, once they uh, uh, enter that ravine, the attack occurs. Mm -hmm. Let me summarize it. It's going to go on on and off, two phases, thunderstorms in between, overall about four hours of killing. Mm -hmm. And now we have a situation where Herkimer is able to get some of his column, but probably he lost 60% in casualties mm. or more mm. in this battle. Very high by the standards yeah. of warfare in the 18th century. Meanwhile, what we also know is that up to 60 of the Indians, mainly uh, Senecas, but some Mohawks, were also seriously wounded and or killed in this mm. battle. Hmm. What this and this is a critical point in Native American history in the New York area, a critical point within hmm. the six nations. Go back to the rules. Number one, we don't kill each other. We don't mm -hmm. fight against each other. What did they do at Oriskany? They fought against each other and they killed each other. Hmm. That is a critical moment in the story of the six nations because hmm. they now have literally weakened themselves because they're doing what? Mm -hmm. They are fighting right. among themselves. Wow. And that's just like, I hate to mm -hmm. say this, the beginning of the end of the strength that the Confederacy mm -hmm. had because it wouldn't fight and kill among mm -hmm. itself. Wow. That's the story. It's amazing. Well, we're talking with James Kirby Martin, author of many books, among them Forgotten Allies, about the Oneida contribution to the American Revolution. Um, and this does have a devastating effect on the Confederacy as a whole. It also prevents the St. Leger's column from getting to aid Burgoyne. And so um, is there 
recognition then on um, part of the Americans of A, the importance of the Oneida, and then B, the devastating impact this has had on the Iroquois Confederation? Well, there are some very nice words that are spoken by certain Americans, mm -hmm. that is, by the uh, representing the white settlers. And I could give you a couple of examples, but I want to also mention a couple of other incidents, maybe before Great. I give you those examples. Great. Uh, and that is now the Oneidas are fully committed to fighting on the American yeah. side. They have become what we call the good and faithful allies. That's mm -hmm. where the title forgotten allies comes from, mm -hmm. because they have they will be forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, and we got a lot. We've talked about this a little bit at the beginning about historical amnesia in regard to Indian or Native American or indigenous history, whatever you want to call it. And they will be forgotten. I'll talk a little bit about that yeah. in just a few minutes. But anyway, the Oneidas will continue. I could give you lots of examples. They will send representatives and they will help, uh, be, especially between the first and the second uh, Saratoga battles between uh, September 7th. If I'm remembering my dates correctly, I think I've already goofed up the dates with uh, uh, with uh, <laughs> the Oriskany battle, but I think it's October 7th. But anyway, the 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 point is they will be engaged in scouting. They will be engaged and they will go out and they'll trap British soldiers and they'll bring them back and interrogate them and frighten them and all these sorts of things. They don't really, they're not allowed. The rules are against scalping or anything like that, but they're helping the intelligence to help uh, uh, at this point, General Horatio Gates and then uh, Benedict Arnold set the uh, winning stage for that particular battle. They'll go on and actually, with some influence of the Marquis de Lafayette, who will visit them, uh, they will be invited in the late winter, early spring of 1778 to go to uh, 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 Valley Forge and uh, perhaps do the same kind of work, that is scouting, keep an eye on the British in Philadelphia, all that sort of thing. And so a number of them will go, and they will be engaged in the battle uh, in uh, mid-May, around May 20th, as I remember, of 1778, called the Battle of Bar Barren Hill, because Washington sends out Lafayette with a rather large force, about 2,000, to uh, sweep south eastward across the Schuylkill River and to sort of figure out what the British were up to in Philadelphia. Let's test them, a little, what we call a reconnaissance in force. The British were on to it and they will move out of Philadelphia in mass and they actually almost catch this force, which would have led to some sort of an annihilation or major battle. The Battle of Barren Hill turned out to be a minor battle. Mm -hmm. But as as Lafayette uh, retreated, he will leave behind some of the United Scouts, mm -hmm. and they will then challenge the, one of the British forces moving forward, delay, 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 delay. Mm -hmm. and, one, and six of them will die mm -hmm. in this battle defending uh, the Americans that need to retreat and get out of all the trouble they're into. Those Indians are buried in a small church, uh, in the Barren Hill area. One of the famous ones there is a man by the name of Thomas Sinovus, uh, who was a sachem, both a peace chief mm -hmm. and a warrior. And uh, anyway, uh, it's a very, well, actually, very it's a story, Jim, They also told a story about Sinovus before as he was finding out about Burgoyne's plan, concealing that's himself. Right. And, and that's right. That's, that's a very important story in and of itself. Uh, and that is something he did as part of a scouting party to help inform Schuyler ahead of the whole uh, la launching of the Burkline campaign. What were they really up to? And he's mm -hmm. very heavily involved in that, uh, showed Can tremendous presence. Yeah. Well, he actually goes north with a, with a uh, uh, small column, a scouting party, uh, and they will make contact uh, with the uh, uh, a group uh, inv involving the St. Ledger expedition, um, and he'll go into the village himself mm -hmm. and sort of walk around as this troop, mm -hmm. these troops are gathering <laughs> and Indians and so on and so forth. Yeah. And he climbs up in the rafters of a building 
and he's listening to the British below, including Sir John Johnson and others, discuss the plan about how we're going to proceed mm -hmm. through the United Territory and what the, the overall operational strategy and plan is. And he comes back mm -hmm. and he's one of them. He reports all of that stuff. This was an incredibly brave yeah. man who gave yeah. his life uh, in mm -hmm. defense of the American uh, or the rebel cause. Amazing. So I, th I think it's an interesting story in and of itself. He is a, he is a major character uh, in the story mm -hmm. uh, and dies tragically in the end. Yeah. I mean, there is enough, more than enough material here to make a better movie than Drums Along yes. the Bulldog. Yes. Well, there is a story about that. Uh, we did come close to making a movie based on the book and the things that we've been talking about in the year 2011. Hmm. My time has passed since then. Wow. But the point is, all sorts of things went wrong. I won't, won't hmm. go into those details. And we had to cancel at the last minute. Uh, so the movie has many. However, there's a new project. Very good. And, uh, we've been, I've been talking with uh, some people about trying to do some sort of a mini series that would tell eventually, virtually the same story. You know, the whole okay. thing with now Hollywood has changed. We're not all rushing off to the theater, right? Uh, and going to the movies. Uh, we've gotten uh, all these streaming services have come yeah. into existence. They're they're looking for material. Uh, Mini series have many of them been very successful, mm -hmm. and so it's a whole new world that wasn't there mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years ago that we may be able to tap into. No, sure. to put a pitch in for this activity. Okay, that that, that is great. I uh, will look forward to subscribing to it. And uh, this is this anyway. Is we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, good. 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 Uh, we're, we're talking with James Kirby Martin, who's actually you, you've written enough material for um, lots oh, of yes. stories. You did, you did you did the film about Benedict Arnold uh, a year yes, ago? Yes, we did, uh, and that was a labor of love, mm -hmm. I guess I could call it. Uh, and uh, we started that project in late two thousand and one. Mm -hmm. It finally was released and does appear on several streaming services. Uh, some of the very good ones, I might add, are well-known ones. Uh, and you can watch it. You can watch it uh, uh, on, what is it called? The Prime Amazon Prime Network, Amazon Prime. There, available. You can buy it or you can watch it. I think it's free. I'm not, okay. And there are others like that, other streaming services out there. But it took only from 2001 to 2021 when we finally had a premiere for the movie. Wow, wow. <laughs> it's called 20 years in, in the making. Wow. And there were up years and there were down years and there were years when nothing was done and it just was a saga that wow. I could go into. But it's done and it's actually re reviewed, I think, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a bit of a different look at Arnold where we say, was he perhaps justified in some of the decisions that he made? given what he had given to the cause and the treatment that he was getting. Right. Uh, we should get back to the Oneida, though. And because, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so what are the consequences for that and for the other Iroquois as a result of all Well, the, the consequences are not good all the way around, not even for the Oneidas in the end. And the best way for me to summarize this would be go to the treaty settlements that come out of the Revolutionary War. Now, the Oneidas continue on fighting for the Americans. Their villages are devastated and run over uh, by British and uh, Joseph Brandt, on, on, on and on and on. We, but let's, let's go to this important peace settlement that's going to be worked out. First of all, the British in 1775 and before had promised, literally, if you fight with us, you will get your territory back. It goes back to the proclamation of 1763, that kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1783, if you look up the Peace of Paris, find me something about what the British did for yeah. the Indians. It is yeah. silent. Mm -hmm. They abandoned them. Good, bad, or indifferent, they were mm -hmm. abandoned. That means they're now turned over to the uh, winning force, the uh, American rebels, and there will be going to be two treaties in 1784. Both of them at Fort Schuyler, now 
morphing back to Fort Stanwix. One is with the state of New York. The other is with the federal government. In the state treaty and in the national treaty, the Uniteds are complimented, exonerated. Mm -hmm. You fought on our side. We appreciate it. I'm going to read a few, a couple of key quotes in a, in a moment on that one. But those other four, now the Tuscaroras were with the Oneidas, that is the Senecas, the Cayugas going west to east, uh, the Onondagas, uh, and the Mohawks all have to make land sessions. Mm -hmm. Your punishment is we're going to take more of your land, and that process is obviously going to continue. The Oneidas, no, no problem. You're good and faithful allies. Whoa, wait a minute here. There are two treaties in 1784. The Oneidas are problem. But then the thought strikes. They have something like 6 million acres, and at this point, they're not even, not even quite 1,000 people. You don't need all that land, right? Even though you're a good and faithful ally, 1785, Governor George Clinton comes out and begins to negotiate with various Oneida leaders and said, can't we make a deal here? Mm. We sort of work something out so we could rent or maybe buy some of your land. Well, all I'm pointing to is that's the beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. How does that end up for the Oneidas? Mm. Very simply, I do it very quickly. Six million acres at the time of the revolution that is defined as their territory within uh, the structure of the six nations. Uh, and the area would then be called Iroquois. Mm -hmm. In 1900, by the census of 1900, the Oneidas could claim 35 acres as their territory. Wow. What happened? Well, we talk about dispersal, and that's really what happened. In the 19th century, as in the early years, some of the Oneidas will, will actually move to Ontario province, uh, some will even league up with their traditional enemy, Joseph Brandt, who was also organizing Indians and new settlements in Ontario province. Many more Oneidas will actually go all the way to the area of Green Bay, Wisconsin, where they have a very major presence today. That is the same place where the football team comes from. All around that area is now was given as Oneida territory. Uh, the Oneidas are still very prominent in that area, so they disperse. The core group, the New York Oneidas, that, that is the group that specifically I've worked with over the years, mm -hmm. the actual New York Oneida Nation, uh, and is recognized as such today. Um, that, is the, that is a smaller group. It's tough to give you an exact number, uh, but <clears throat> their numbers slowly declined, then began to build back up. Maybe a thousand or more represent the Oneida Nation uh, in New York today, and are have come back amazingly so, and are very pro are very very prosperous uh, people. But anyway, that's I mean that's the overview. Wow, they yeah. lost it all. Oh, and basically, yeah. now they have by as I would say, by getting involved in the gaming business and the hotel mm -hmm. business and the golf business, in the gas business, you name it, they are into it. Mm -hmm. They have become and become again a very prosperous people as they were before mm -hmm. it's a different kind of prosperity mm -hmm. than was before uh but uh uh overall the nation i would put it in the uh, major prospering category mm -hmm. so that's kind of the story wow. but but let me tell you at the time mm -hmm. and i have to i have to uh if you excuse I do have to put on my reading glasses, but I want to read you a, cu a couple of contemporary quotes. Excuse me with my old horn rims here. Now, this quote about the Oneidas in their service, they weren't saying this about the others, obviously, no. uh, in the nations. This is a pledge by uh, the delegates of the Continental Congress to the Oneida Indian Nation, December 3rd, 1777, thanking them, obviously, for their service at Oriskany and for their ser service at Saratoga. Here we go. Quote, we have experienced your love, strong as the oak, and your fidelity, unchangeable as truth. While the sun and moon continue to give light to the world, we shall love and respect you. As our trusty friends, we, as our trusted friends, we shall protect you and shall at all times consider your welfare as our own. 
Did it turn no. off that way? Hmm. Quote number two. This is from Philip Schuyler. To the Oneida Indians, he's a head Indian commissioner, commissioner from the Continental Congress in the area, as well as being a major general, May 11, 1778. Accept my best thanks for your friendly care and attention to the interests of the United States. I have often told you that the conduct which you have held uh, would always entitle you to our love and esteem. Yet, I repeat with pleasure and sooner, should a fond mother forget her only son, then we shall forget you. Hmm. Right? Well, wow. Two quotes. Yeah. Forever we're going to remember you. Right, yeah. So why do we call them forgotten allies? Mm -hmm. So I want to mm -hmm. give you this uh, particular story. The General Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette, did develop working relations with the United States. He was actually at the New York Conference in 1784, that is the, the, the Fort Stanwix uh, mm -hmm. Treaty Conference with the state of New York. And he said to the Indians, you made the mistake. You're going to pay. You should have maintained your neutrality. By mm. getting involved, you have lost. Mm. That's what wow. often happens in war. Right. He, he's, he's complimenting the Oneidas at the same time. Then let's jump way ahead. We get to the year 1824, and Lafayette is invited back to America uh, to help celebrate what would be the 50th anniversary uh, of the country, uh, and that would be in 17, I mean, in 2025 and 20. Yeah. I'll get dates 17, 18, 18, 18, 18, 18. It has to be. It has yeah. to be somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> the, the centuries all blend together. Right. That's like they just dates apparently are not my thing, even though I'm a historian. But the the uh, the point is, it is it is actually 1825, 1826. Well, he comes back in 1824, does a grand tour of all 22 states. Yeah. And he's going to June of 1825. Uh, he ends up in Utica, New York, which is mm -hmm. grown up around the Erie Canal. Yeah. The Oneidas have been totally shoved aside. The settlers no longer really know their history, know anything about them. Lafayette arrives on this particular day, and he said, where are my friends, the Oneidas? Mm -hmm. And the local officials look at him. Well, what are you talking about? But then he spies. There's a small group. One of them is Cornelius, the son of Han Yeri, uh, and uh, two kettles the dock staters, mm -hmm. and he's there now as an old man. And Lafayette says, stop everything. I'm going to meet with my former colleagues and allies. And he will go meet mm -hmm. with a small group of Indians. The settlers there, you know, they don't know what he's doing. What's the matter with this guy? Mm -hmm. Doesn't know who the important people are? You know, we're old yeah. veterans. And I lost my leg at, you know, wherever, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And the point is, he's still remembered and he's still recognized, even though the community mm -hmm. that was built on top of the United Nation has no recollection. Wow. So one of the things that I would say that we try to do as historians is we try to recreate or reformulate, reorganize, whatever, the past. Yes. So what is really good, I think, as a historian, is that now we are in, and we have been actually now for several years, maybe almost 50 years, I could say, beginning to recognize all those people that weren't part of this traditional story, as it was told. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a very, very important development. In some cases, maybe we've gone to extreme. Uh, we've mm -hmm. lost the central focus. We've uh, sort of, I don't know what the right word is to describe it, but we sort of balkanized ourselves. Yeah. Uh, so we got this group here and this group there and this group over there, and we're not coming back together as a people. Mm. But you know, there was a major program in the 1990s under the Clinton administration that was called Coming Together. And that mm. was to bring communities of diverse people together to try to live peacefully, harmoniously, and with great prosperity as the all-inclusive American people. Great. Well, thank you very much. We've been talking with James Kirby Martin, whose actually work as an historian has made it possible for us to reimagine and to come together. So I want to thank you for 
the work you've done, and thank you for this wonderful conversation about the role of the Oneida in the American Revolution. And thank you. It's my my pleasure. Even though I screwed up a few dates. Well, that's right. <laughs> we'll correct that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, you're dubbed in the right dates. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, that's right. I'm trying to stay on the big picture. That, that's right. This is great. And I want to thank uh, all of our listeners and Jonathan Lane, our producer. And I want to thank our listeners in Bountiful, Utah, and in Germantown and Montgomery, both in the state of New York, and uh, Pattaya and Chonburi and Thailand, and all places in between. And if you are listening from one of these places, send Jonathan Lane an email, jlane at revolution250.org, and he'll send you some of our Revolution 250 refrigerator magnets with quotes from the committee of correspondents from the towns of Massachusetts. And so as we continue to remember the events of the revolution and think about ways to commemorate and ways to tell this great story. So thank you so much, James Kirby Martin, for being with us today. And now we will be hyped out on the road to Boston.